What if I were to tell you a true story that took you back in time? It told you a little bit something about what occurred in times past, and then it uh, uh, went a little bit into the uh, current state time frame that we have today, and then it jetted into the future. Would you believe that that's actually possible? As you may well know, that it, it is possible, and uh, the Bible, which is obviously the written and inspired Word of God, provides that kind of information. So today, with, we will, in a sense, within our minds, travel in time and take a look at the past and see how that relates to the present as it is applicable to this upcoming Passover. And as Passover draws near, my goal for today, my single goal, is to help us to gain or maintain our perspective. And the Bible provides all the knowledge we need to explore uh, the depths of time as it applies to our physical and spiritual existence, and that's obviously relative to our salvation as, as God's children. But as God's people, we need to know that the, the Bible provides an outline for God's plan. And the plan of God is thought to be roughly uh, 7,000 years. Uh, if we were to guesstimate where we're at in the plan of God, the most reliable source would be the Hebrew calendar. And according to the Hebrew calendar, the year obviously is not 2014. The actual year is 5,774. And so that's thought to be the count of years since Adam and Eve were first placed on this planet as the first human beings. And obviously, before I even talk about a timeline, I have to tell you the fact that the Bible clearly states that no man knows the day nor the hour of Christ's coming. There's a lot of things in prophecy that we don't know the exact timing of anything, and we don't try to know because it's not relevant to our salvation. But it is something that we need to keep in our minds, something that we need to watch as we look at the world events unfolding But if, if you were to throw an arrow, a dart at this chart um, to see where we're at in the timeline, it'd be about right there. And that's what we classify as God's people, the end time. And so we are in the end time, if you look at the 7,000-year timetable. And obviously a 1,000 of those years in the 7,000-year timetable is uh, the millennial reign of Jesus Christ on earth after he returns And so there's 6,000 years made available in the time phase plan uh, of God for uh, the rule of man to, to be here on earth, in addition to Satan being here on this earth. And uh, so we could have 226 years until Christ's re- return, or we could have 400 years until Christ's return. Either way, it's very close. But we do know that time will be cut short for the uh, sake of mankind completely destroying themselves. But the reason why I mention this is for you to understand where we're at in the present. And we'll get back to the present, but first let's travel back in times past. A time before the beginning of the 7,000 year uh, that, that mankind has been given to be on the earth. And to many this information is clouded in mystery, but I think as you Uh, read through the scriptures with me, you'll find that the reality of the past is quite apparent. Genesis 1-1. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to turn there, that's Genesis 1-1, easiest book in the Bible to turn to. And it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this is likely one of the most overseen, overlooked realities of God's creation. This was not 7,000 years ago. This was billions, if not trillions, of years ago when the heavens and earth were initially created. And the earth itself is thought to be 4 to 5 billion years, years old. That's what scientists say. Who knows how old it really is? So the very beginning of physical matter as we know it, this is talking about that. And God created the heavens and the earth, and that means galaxies, solar systems, that means planets. And within all the billions of planets that have made, been made, uh, this planet was made. The, the planet we intimately know of and call Earth. So if we go to uh, verse 2, there's something that happened in between verse 1 
and verse 2. So I'd like to turn to Ezekiel 28 real quick. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. And verse 11, it says, Moreover, the world... Word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up your lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God, and every precious stone was your covering, the sardas, the topaz, the diamond, the beryl, the onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you the day you were created. And you were anointed, carib who covers. And I established you, and you were on the holy mountain of God. And you walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. I actually did a little bit of research on that fiery stones comment. And uh, apparently it's alluding to extreme light that uh, was coming from the throne of God. It, apparently it has, they, they theorize that the, the, the fiery stones are jewels that are surrounded uh, God's throne. Verse 15, you were perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. And by the abundance of your training, you became filled with violence within, from within, and you sinned. And therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cher cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. So here is this perfect being, and which, at the, by the way, at the time his name was Lucifer, and he was given greatness. And he, he was given great talent, great beauty, great responsibility. A cherub is one of the highest ranking uh, members uh, in God's kingdom. It actually covers the throne of God. And Lucifer actually saw the initial creation of the planets, the earth. But somewhere along the way, likely the plan of God, he started to understand what he was doing and his heart changed. And he changed his heart from a serving, loving, obedient uh, member of God's kingdom to one of which is selfish. His motivating factors changed. And he was unloving to the point to where he rebelled against the God of heaven and earth. Now, we don't have time to go into it, but Isaiah 14 verse 12 mentions Satan being cast to the earth because of his rebellion. I think I'll mention it a little bit later, but there was a, a great battle with this re rebellion. Uh, and at, at the end of that battle is when Satan was thrown down to this planet. And so it's important to understand this being that we just took a brief look at. He's the one. He's the one that's deceiving this world. He's the one that has set the bad example for the world to follow. He's causing wars, rumors of wars hatred, and he's an enabler. He wants mankind to fail because mankind is God's creation and he wants to rule this earth, not have God rule this earth. But as we move to uh, verse two, Genesis one verse two, we can see that the earth is flooded in water. Uh, and just looking at Genesis one verse two, it says the earth was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That would have been a magnificent thing to see. But so the earth was flooded with water at this point in time in history and uh, it was without form and void. And the original Hebrew for without form and void is tohu and bohu. A lot of people who've been around for a while, you've probably heard that before. But that means, you, when you translate it directly, it means waste, desolate, deteriorated. And the word was is also translated became. And so it wasn't always this way. It actually transformed at some point uh, into this current state. Uh, and, and then later became an uh, oceanic surface of some, some kind. And a general hy hypothesis is that the battle between God and Satan uh, was where the point where all, all this devastation took place, uh, you know, in this solar system and perhaps in the universe. But the earth was subject to lawlessness, and many of the, of the planets were likely out of orbit. orbit. Some have potentially been destroyed. 
I recall Mr. Armstrong mentioning his lack of surprise when the first rover landed on Mars, and it was completely dead from what their sensors showed, uh, and I think they'll find that. They'll find that all these planets, at least around uh, the Earth and, and probably further, have been destroyed for whatever reason, likely because of this battle, and that you can find a sterile environment, completely purified from whatever occurred. And the scripture also mentions that there was a darkness. So that means the earth was likely not around a, salt, a star. It didn't have a star as its primary source of light. Clearly there wasn't any angelic light because God, God's Holy Spirit does bring forth light. And, and so the only light at this point in Scripture was the, the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the deep. So the earth is actually in a place where there's no moon, no sun. There's an absolute lack of form, and there's a great void. And so here comes the Spirit of God hovering over the face of the waters. And Genesis 1 verse 3 indicates that he places the earth by the sun and gives it a moon. He, and uh, then he begins to put things back in order. He creates a balance in the solar system that, so then it could support life. Let's picking, pick it up in Genesis 1 verse 26. This starts, this is where God's plan starts to really develop. Genesis 1 verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. We're not made, uh, God, uh, we're not, uh, God doesn't look like us, we look like him. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over, every, er, over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female, and he created, created them. It says that he created them a lot, because he did, and he wanted to make sure that was pretty clear. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and mul multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So I, I have a quick question for you. What do you think is the most complex and most unknown object known to mankind? I don't know if I have any takers. I'll give you a hint. It's not the human body, but it's a hint. It's the human brain. The human brain, it's the most unknown object in all of existence. And scientists have actually validated that. They agree with that. They know nothing of the brain uh, comparative to other things that we know about. But we know more about the universe than we do the human brain. The human brain contains more computing power than mankind is capable of accurately computing. They still don't really know what, compare, what you could compare it to. It's not a comparative to today's uh, software systems and, and, uh, and uh, technology. The average brain has 90 billion neur neurons. And to top all of that, it's an electrochemical makeup, which makes it completely unique, every single brain. And once it dies, it can't be restored or, or anything like that. It's electrochemical. Uh, it's very difficult to explain how the brain functions. They, they, they're actually, uh, the president actually initiated a, a project just to map the human brain. Uh, they're gonna invest billions in, in this subject matter. Then you have the human DNA. And obviously God genetically engineered everything that's living around us. All living things, this includes plants. Everything, everything that lives on the face of this planet has DNA. And the unique thing about D DNA is the DNA platform is all the same. All of it. The only difference is the amino sequence of the DNA. So, you know, evolutionists don't really have a good answer for that. They say it's natural selection. I say it's creation. According to a book entitled Evolution, A Theory and Crisis, DNA's actual size is only two millionths of a millimeter thick. 
A teaspoon of DNA, according to a molecular biologist, Michael Denton, could ten contain all the information needed to build the proteins for all the species of organisms that have ever lived on the Earth. And there would still be enough room left over for all the information in every book ever written. That's how magnificent just the DNA is. Another unique thing about us and all living creatures on this face of this planet is that we were made from soil. Genesis 2 verse 7 indicates um, that we're composed of the physical elements found in our soil. And because of that, because of that plus uh, 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 like DNA patterns, we're able to consume almost everything that comes from the soil. Let's pick up the story Genesis and Genesis 2. Genesis 2 verse 8. And it says, the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. So he just took all these components out of the earth, formed the bone, the sinew, the muscles, the brain, all these things that are extremely complex. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge, the knowledge of good and evil. So in the midst of all this was created these two trees. And so you have these two trees. This is probably not what they look like, but it's a good visual representation. And you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the intriguing thing about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is that when we turn our knowledge towards anything other than God's, this is the tree we're consuming. This is the tree that we're relying upon. This is, if you will, our default tree. It feels right. It seems good to us. You know, self-reliance always feels really good. Um, but then we fail to realize the implications of su such an act, and we'll cover that in a little bit. Another unique part of this tree is that uh, no Holy Spirit is given with this tree. You don't have a helper. You're truly on your, lo your own. Now, you do have uh, the spirit of man, and so that's your primary source of knowledge, and that's the primary source of knowledge all around us. And, and this is why we have a world combined, combined with uh, good and evil. So the, the other thing is that ultimately the end result of going down the path of the knowledge of good and evil is that the end result is eternal death. There will be some th of those at the end of God's plan who will not choose God's way of life. They do not want it. And because he loves them, their uh, end result will be eternal death. Unlike Satan and, and the demons that rebelled, they can't die, their spirit. So they, they won't have that luxury. But then you have the tree of life. And the tree of life is obviously reliance on God's word. And when we live a repentant life, we leading down a path of righteousness, we gain figuratively the potential to eat of this tree. And one who eats of this tree gains eternal life. That is what would have happened if Adam and Eve would have eaten of that tree. They probably would have lived their lives uh, as, as human beings, but their, the end result would have been eternal life in the family of God. And so God's Holy Spirit is given to those who willingly want the tree of life. And I think we all know that the Holy Spirit is given at baptism. And that's when we make an individual covenant with God. And we accept God and his way of life, and we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we commit ourselves to being a part of the family and following the family rules. And the Holy Spirit is the primary source of knowledge with the tree of life. You know, God created heaven and earth alone with his knowledge. It's his wisdom that created these things and, and provides great understanding through his word in, in the Bible. And the end result of this tree ultimately 
is eternal life. Let's talk a little bit about sin versus righteousness. Isaiah 59 verse 1. In Isaiah 59 verse 1, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. And your lips have spoken lies, and your tongue has muttered, muttered perversity. And no one calls for justice, nor does any plead for the truth. And they trust in empty words and speak lies, and they conceive evil and bring forth iniquity. So sin here uh, is the transgression of God's law. And as you can see on the left, this is representative of sin. This is us because we like running away from it, I think. Most, most, pe most people uh, do try to flee from sin. But the more you sin, the closer to Satan you become. The closer to the world, the closer to the knowledge of good and evil, the more reliant you become, the more you sin. And then you have uh, righteousness. And righteousness is something that God's people are striving for. And we work diligently to run down this path of light, uh, right, uh, righteousness. And this is a path led by God's Holy Spirit. When we're baptized, God works with us through his word and through uh, the knowledge of his truth to make the right choices in our lives. And the interesting thing about righteousness is the more righteousness you become, the more righteous a man or a woman becomes, the closer to God you get. And obviously, uh, righteousness can only be gained with true rep repentance and true forgiveness. For, when you truly repent, you are forgiven. Let's turn to Genesis 6, verse 5. So now we're going a little bit further down the timeline. Genesis 6, verse 5. It says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was, was only evil continually. Could you imagine that? Everybody on the earth was evil continually in their heart, not even in action. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. After everything he did, this is what has become of man. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. And verse 8, thankfully, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So sometime after Adam and Eve, the earth had this great wickedness that had progressed. And at this point in history, God was so displeased with the wickedness that he almost destroyed all of mankind. And transgression of God's law uh, obviously greatly displeases God. And Noah was the only righteous man on the face of the earth. And why would that be? What made him righteous? Well, he likely followed God's law. He followed the Sabbath. And his heart was one of, the, one of, which, of, of repentance and looking to God for the guidance he needs in his life to succeed. And so the earth was flooded a second time. If you recall in Genesis, the, the earth was initially flooded, and so God flooded it again. And I think we can tie this all together now quickly here. Exodus 3, verse 13. I think you'll see where I'm going with this in a few minutes. Exodus 3, verse 13. And this is going back to where, where Moses was speaking with God at the burning bush. The Israelites were in Egypt and they were enslaved uh, to Pharaoh. In Exodus 3 verse 13, it says, Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
Kind of sounds philosophical, but it actually makes sense when you think about it. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So the God of the Old Testament had a name that he chose to relay to the Israelites, and his name was I am. And throughout the Bible uh, is also called Lord, Lord God. Let's turn to John 54. 8 verse 54. John 8 verse 54. This is Jesus Christ speaking to the Jews. And it says, uh, breaking into the discussion between Jesus, Jesus and the Jews, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. And your father Abraham reject, rejoiced to see me my day. And he saw it and was glad. So apparently Abraham had a vision of Christ, uh, perhaps a plan of God and, and Christ's uh, initial entrance on, on this earth as our Lord and Savior. In verse 57, then the Jews said to him, you are not 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? How's that possible? And Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And this scripture ties to Exodus 3 verse 13. So this, the God of the Old Testament, the God that recreated heaven and earth, who created mankind and all living creatures from the dust of the earth. He walked in the garden of, of, of um, Eden with Adam and Eve and he taught the laws of his way of life to them. He reflooded the earth to purify mankind and destroy a great wickedness. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the God who led Israel from the house of bondage into the promised land and the God who established the way of life that you and I live today. This was the God that would later on become Jesus Christ. And this is the spirit being I am who from great glory and honor and beauty reduced himself down to a man. I tried to contemplate what would the humility, how much humility would it take to do that? If you're God, I think it takes a lot of humility, more than we could probably comprehend. And think of the love. Out of love, out of deep love, like a father protecting his child or a, a husband protecting his wife, he freely gave his perfect and pure life so that we can be forgiven and have the opportunity for eternal life. The initial opportunity he wanted to give Adam and Eve, and they failed. But now there's a, there's, we're capable of succeeding. Romans 8 verse 35 states that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And it, it, so it's up to us to repent of our sins and ask God to forgive us through the loving sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And you can sin. He's, he's still going to love you. He can't have anything to do with sin, but he still loves his, his children. Let's turn to Romans 5, verse 6. Starting to tie together this timeline that we went through. Romans 5, verse 6 says, For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. You know, would we die for somebody who's righteous? Scarcely most people would. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. If they're just a good person, I, I don't know if I'm going to give my life for them. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having, being rec having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. 
And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So Christ essentially took our place, said, no, you don't need to die for this. I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to die for you, for me. And this is because the penalty for sin is death. So every sin we make, that penalty is death. And the love and sacrifice of Christ our Lord is something to contemplate and to be very thankful for. So since the beginning, there's been a great plan. Uh, the Bible indicates uh, the historical uh, occurrences, which tells us the background of how we get to this particular moment in time. And God created all things and then recreated the earth. And as part of that recreation, he created us, mankind. And, and he went through intricate detail to do that. And he took great care to, to create us. And then there was two trees, and these two trees symbolize the choice we have before us. We have a choice um, to lead a path of righteousness which draws us closer to God, the Father, or we can choose a path of unrighteousness which pushes us away from God and puts us towards a path of unrighteousness. And in Noah's time, most chose that path. All, almost all, except one man and his family was saved because everyone was unrighteous. And as, as a result, all of humanity was destroyed because of their unrighteousness. And that's because Noah was a righteous man. And then there was Jesus Christ. He was and is the I Am of the Old Testament. And out of his love and sacrifice, he gave himself to enable the sal salvation of those whom will be a part of his family. And so Christ has taken our place. And because of his righteousness, we're saved. So here we are in a, a moment in time. And time is short. <clears throat> we have, we, almost 6,000 years have been passed since Adam and Eve. Uh, you and I are not going to live a relatively long time, even if you're a young guy, but 75, 80 years is all we have, maybe 90, 100. Hopefully there's no 100-year-olds in the audience, but we don't have much time, however much time we have. It's all relative, but so we have before us the same choice Adam and Eve was given. The two trees, one of knowledge of good and evil and the one of the tree of life. And really, we have to keep a focus on that reality. It, it's our sober responsibility that we have to understand that our sins and our weaknesses must be repented. And God will forgive us because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. As a closing scripture, let's turn to 2 Peter verse 3. This talks about God's promise. There's a lot of promises that God has made and all of them he will make. 2 Peter uh, 3, verse 1, it says, I, beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stir up in your pure minds by the way of reminder. He wants to remind God's people. He's talking to God's people right here. And as I stand today reading this scripture, it's just as true today as it was back then. In verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. And so we really need to contemplate and internalize the words spoken by the prophets of God and truly understand and place in our hearts the commandments of God and, and contemplate the plan of God. It's good to contemplate the plan of God, the creation of all things, the reality of Jesus Christ, and the great gift he has given to all mankind through his sacrifice. In verse 3, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts. And there will, will be many, and there are many, that walk this path uh, where they're just all about themselves, and they don't care about you or I. What they want to do is please themselves. 
But these people that come along, they'll say, verse 4, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. There's, there's many out there who have lost hope. But there's a plan. God has a plan. And sometimes it takes a lot of patience to wait for his plan to come to fruition. But to deny God pushes away mankind from God and closer to Satan, which is what Satan wants. Verse 5, for this they will willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. So by God's word, as we discussed earlier, the heavens were made initially and the earth was made and, and then flooded and then again flooded and great things have taken a place in the past to lead up to the present Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, the same word that created it, preserves it, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So the very word that created all things keep all things moving. And ultimately, this is all going to burn up, ultimately. Verse 8, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that the Lord, with the Lord, one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So it might seem like a long time to wait, not much time for God. But time for us is of the essence. And verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So God's word is finite and true. There's nothing that God has ever said or promised that is, not, uh, tr f that is uh, false. And some doubt g God, but as God's people, obviously we don't. And God's willing to wait for us. He's willing to work with us to develop and, and ultimately succeed in this, in this life. Let's turn to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, and when which the heavens will pass away with great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burnt up. Verse 11, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking, looking for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. And nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So as we make final preparations for the Passover in this moment of time, let's keep our perspective of the reality of the past as we contemplate the present and look towards the future, a new heaven and a new earth with Christ and God the Father ruling over. But looking and running down this path of righteousness will ultimately lead us to God's kingdom.